Welcome everyone. We are on the page and I am your host, Jen Mulvihill. Our guest for this episode is a retired school teacher. She has a master's degree in history. She writes historical fiction fantasy under the pen name of Adele Lane. She is the founder of Pass Prologue Press and she is an award-winning best-selling author. Please welcome Melody Romeo. Hi, Jen. Hi, Melody, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. You look absolutely fabulous. So young, it's just crazy. Oh, thank you. I'm not as young as I look, though. It's <laughs> the humidity in the South that does it. <laughs> well, if anyone's wondering why I'm in a cave, um, among all the other things I do, I'm an over-the-road truck driver, and I live in my truck. And right now, it's getting pretty dark outside. And even though I have all the lights on in the truck, this is this is all we can muster. Well, you look fabulous, and it's so it's been a while since we've seen each other—a couple of years now, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, with COVID, we have to be doing all of these virtual conventions, and you don't get to see people. Yes, um, I think it was uh, up in Kentucky we last saw each yeah. other. Um, yeah, in Louisville. Yeah, in Louisville, yeah. And that was that was quite a convention. It was fun. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah. And I hope we get to see each other again soon because it's um, conventions are starting to start up again. And yeah, and yeah. looking forward to that. It's a little light at the end of the tunnel, if you don't mind the pun on the having no light in my <laughs> well it just accentuates you <laughs> so i'd like to ask you we're going to go back in time a little bit um to your childhood i oh, long before you were born okay uh, probably not far, <laughs> probably not that far back but i would like to know what books did you read that impressed you or that stuck well, in your mind? The first book that I remember ever reading as a child was Watership Down. Oh, Which yeah. I'm sure every little child has read. And I was excited about that. I, I loved dinosaur books. And, of course, those weren't stories. I was just learning about dinosaurs. And I was a weird child because I enjoyed getting out the world book encyclopedias and looking up things and reading about them. And then my mother, well, she had this huge library. She was an English and literature teacher, and uh, she liked mysteries. Agatha Christie was her favorite author. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wasn't into that many pages of words as a child. Um, I loved my mother's uh, Leonardo da Vinci, The Complete Works. It's a huge wow. coffee table book, and I would spend hours looking at all the pictures and all the inventions and all the drawings and different things. And, um, I really enjoyed that. And then I got uh, a little bit older and more into reading, you know, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And then junior high school, I discovered Edgar Allan Poe and absolutely loved Edgar Allan Poe. He has such a way with words. It, it's just amazing the way he could put words together to give you a feeling. Um, oh, definitely. He's one of my favorites, too. I, I have a whole shrine dedicated to him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, of course, we hit high school, and, and my life revolved around band. So my reading consisted of things that I could use for book reports for English class. So I really got into the classics, um, uh, John Steinbeck and uh, Herman Melville, mm -hmm. uh, all the right just so do you think that led you to your fascination of history it, it might have well my mother uh loved history as well but really it was the television shows and movies i loved anything that was sword fighting and horseback riding anything back in time in the old days uh, you oh, know yeah. all the old uh, knights of the round table movies and Three Musketeers and Robin Hood and all, all of that. I just absolutely love the. What was your favorite? Took you back in time. Well, oh, don't start with the favorites. <laughs> ben Hur. <laughs> ben Hur. Uh, That's a long yeah. movie. <laughs> it is. 
this button. Uh, it, you know, I can see through the whole thing. It's six years old. So. Yeah. yeah. I remember when, um, who, I think it was the Bible story came out. It was so long that yeah. had an intermission. I, mean, I think I saw it at the theater. That's how old I am. I saw it at yep. the theater and it literally had an intermission where you had to go, you get to go out and yep. go to the bathroom before you go back in and watch the rest of the movie. Yeah, Gone, Gone with the Wind had an intermission as well. So, yeah. And the they just don't, I believe. They don't do that anymore. I mean, now you're expected to no. sit through a four-hour movie and not go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to miss anything in Lord of the Rings, so I would make sure I wouldn't need to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have I have those on um on video or not VHS anymore, obviously uh, disc, and I watch DVD, those periodically. Yeah. But I also still read the books. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. you know, so. Well, yeah. Um, so, what led you to writing? I have always written stories since I learned how to write words on a page. Mm -hmm. uh, my very first book was in first grade. I completed, of course, it was a dinosaur book. Oh. And it was entirely, entirely plagiarized. Um, <laughs> I did the artwork. I drew and colored the dinosaurs. And then I copied in my own handwriting everything about them out of one of the dinosaur books from the library. So <laughs> I didn't know about plagiarism in first grade. but Well, nobody does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that's pretty cool. So when did you, you learn that a language had power? Was that your superpower? Oh, I don't know about it being my superpower. But um, my mother really appreciated books and reading. And it was always a part of our life with me growing up. And I had... Uh, dyslexia, which is not really a handicap. It's just a different way of seeing things. And so I was very good at reading comprehension, but pretty slow at reading. So we would spend the summers, I would bring books and mother would read them to me. Um, but yes, words definitely um, have power because there would be some things that she would be reading to me or that I actually took the time to bother to read for myself that, you know, it really kind of made an impact. Oh, this is so inspiring. I want to be like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I guess I really learned about words having power from the Bible because there's this really significant verse that says the power of life and death are in the tongue. And they that speak it, um, they that love it, will you know, eat the fruit thereof. So, yeah, what you say, words um, do have, have power. Right, they do. Um it's interesting that you said you mentioned that you have dyslexia. A lot of people don't realize that I have that as well. And oh, I think okay. a lot of authors have that. And so it, it causes more of a struggle for us to write. Actually, it's 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 a blessing because it is a, a known fact that people with dyslexia happen to be have very highly uh, attuned creative centers in their brain. They tend mm -hmm. to be more creative, like Leonardo da Vinci. Um, uh, for an example, um, and uh, Albert Einstein. Um, but people with dyslexia do tend to be more creative than the average person. So you're saying we're geniuses. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I'll take exactly. that. <laughs> well, in your case, anyway. Oh, I think you are, too. In fact, <laughs> I, want to, I want to trip down memory lane here with your first I think it was your first novel was called Vlad. That's I'm not sure. Correct. If your, okay. And that That's is my getting first published novel. First published Ooh, novel. First published. Right. Yeah. I had about 12 completed in their notebooks that I never went any farther than my shelf. But that was the first one that I um, actually went all the way through with publication. And that is having a rebirth now. Yes, yes. It has a new name, a new cover, and has been re-edited to meet the uh, modern standards. Um, and it is now called Tribute in Blood, a tale mm -hmm. of Vlad the Pilot. And what's interesting to me is your research in, in doing that novel. Tell me a little bit more about that. <clears throat> well, 
when I wrote this, the internet was very new and didn't have the plethora of information that it does now. So I spent many days going to the library. Um, I ordered all kinds of books about Vladimir Paver's life and, and went through them very carefully and uh, did a lot of uh, research the old fashioned way uh, for that one, taking notes at the library and bringing them home and putting it together. And so basically what I've created is a historical fiction tale that includes many of the actual facts surrounding Vlad the Imperator. It has a lot of quotes of things he actually said. It has um, <clears throat> little quotes from primary sources of what chroniclers were writing about him at the time that he was in power. And then I have fictional characters that are added into the story. My two protagonists um, who are the ones who, you see, history tells us all this horrible stuff that Vlad did, along with mm -hmm. the good stuff, because he was a very capable military leader and was constantly defeating the Ottoman Turks that were trying to invade Europe. So a lot of people liked him and overlooked the fact that he was a mass murderer. Right. But, um, but uh, where was I going? Oh, no. oh yeah. We <laughs> know where and when and pretty much how um, Vlad Dracula was killed. But history does not record, and nobody has any clue who actually killed him. Oh wow! And so that's kind of what that's kind of what set up the whole plot of my novel because my two fictional characters are the people who who come together to bring him down. To bring him, they each have their own reason because he killed people close to them, and they mm -hmm. wanted to get him out of power and get rid of him. <clears throat> I love I love that story because it, it has. Well, I love history, so it, it has a different cool. take. I mean, everybody writes Bram Stoker, of course. You know, everybody right. has this this fantasy of the 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 vampire and and Dracula and and all that. But yours is more of a historical, almost facts oh, yeah. about oh, yeah. the actual person. Yes, in, in the and, and the thing is that that when you look at the facts of the approximately 100,000 people who he was responsible for killing in his short period of time that he was in power of about six years and three months. Um, he's just so much more fearsome than a little vampire who kills a few women and drains their blood, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was more of a monster than a vampire ever thought about Mu being. Much, much more. Yes. He didn't have the excuse of not having a soul. Of course, he right. may have forgotten it and buried it deep down inside and stomped all over it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he had good intentions, did he not? <laughs> well, actually, he did. And this is yeah. the thing that is so bizarre. And I try to include not just how villainous he was, but how in his own mind, he thought of himself as being a hero. Mm -hmm. Because he wanted, he was ruling a portion of what is today Romania called Wallachia. And he wanted his little principality to become strong enough to be a separate country that didn't have to be under the authority of the Austrians or the Hungarians or, or the Ottomans or anybody else. <clears throat> but in order to do this, he needed to uh, master trade. He needed mm -hmm. to... Uh, to stamp out crime. He needed to uh, get rid of poverty. And he just did all that by killing all the poor people and making execution the, the sentence for every single crime committed. And uh, if anyone appeared to be not trading favorably with this country, he killed all the merchants too. So yeah, Goodness. that was his solution. Kill them all, kill them, kill them all. Kill them all, wipe them out, and start over, right? <laughs> there you go, there you go. <laughs> My goodness. Well, um, and it is a really good, interesting read. So any I I um I think everyone should read that book, especially the new one that comes out or the, the rebirth of it. Um, but let's talk about Adele Lane and and those yes. publishers. Tell me about well, I'm those. Very excited. Um, Adele Lane's first published novel was um, Heart of Sherwood, 
and it is a gender bent retelling of the Robin Hood story. Once again, from a much more factual, historically based perspective than most of the Robin Hood stories um, out on the market or in the theaters. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, except for, you could say, except for the fact that in my story, Robin is a woman instead of a man. Um, but uh, if, if you go back to the earliest Robin Hood stories, which started, you know, way back in the like 14, 1300s, um, they started telling stories about this uh, hero that robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. And the mm -hmm. first ones described Robin as being a youth, a beardless youth of about 14 or 15 years old. Well, my Robin is closer to 20 years old, but being a woman, uh, disguised as a boy, um, they think that because she doesn't have any hair on her face that uh, she's this little teenager. So, um, you know, it kind of plays into to that story. Also, all of the other Robin Hood stories leave out a very important person in history, which is Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was King Richard's mother. And while wow. King Richard was being, while he was kidnapped and being held for ransom, which is basically when the story takes place because Prince John is running amok and the evil sheriff of Nottingham is his friend and he's doing all these bad things too. But what people always forget about is that Eleanor was the regent of England while King Richard was in captivity. She was the one who was really running the country. And oh, wow. so um, I have included her in the story as well. She's trying to raise the ransom to free Richard. And uh, John is working at Crossroads because he wants some of that money to buy his mercenaries so that he can usurp the throne while Richard is away. And hmm. the historical fact that uh, John even started uh, spreading rumors that Richard was dead so that people would rally behind him so he could be crowned king. <laughs> I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. And, well, and Eleanor was a very remarkable woman. I mean, she's like almost 80 years old and gets on this ship and sails to Germany to bring the money to the Holy Roman Emperor so that she can get Richard back. I mean, nothing stopped her. She was brilliant. She was a political powerhouse. Um, she really reinvented England and brought culture and, and made everything real civilized as much as possible for that time period, a very remarkable woman. I think that's awesome that, that you write that aspect of the story because a lot of people don't realize how many women in history were actually really running the show. And there was quite a few. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the and that's a good tip to want to overlook that. <laughs> well, so. and you're bringing forth the, the real history. Uh, and that's what I love about your writing is that the history involved I try to throw real history into into my stories as well, and I think that what that's what makes for a good read is because people can read it, especially kids. Um, when they read, they're like, "Oh, this is real. This really happened," yeah. and you're like, "Yeah, it did." So, well, I, I, we I don't that. know. Yeah. Cool. We don't know if there was a real Robin Hood or not. I, I researched every Robin Hood incarnation possible in preparing for the book. And there really is no evidence that there was such a person. But mm -hmm. the plethora of stories would suggest that there may have been someone who did something to start all of the bard songs and poems and stories and tales mm -hmm. of, about them. So if we're going to use a made up character anyway, why not make him a her? Well, why not? I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into uh, publishing now? Oh, okay. Well, see, Heart of Sherwood was published through a traditional publisher. Right. Um, I was so excited to get a publisher. And I was mm -hmm. working on another book, uh, actually a trilogy for the same publishing house. And and uh, Heart of Sherwood uh, was a runner up for the Imaginarium Award in 2019. Won mm -hmm. first place in the uh, Rainbow Awards for 2019. And when I went in to submit my next book, they said, oh, I'm sorry, but we are having to close and we're going to be, we're going to be out of business because 
it, it, it's very, I mean, they've been in business for about seven years, but it's very hard for a small press to make mm-hmm. ends meet. Um, and so they were going, they were going to have to close because they just weren't making enough money to be viable and the people running it needed to get other jobs. So I said, well, what's going to happen to Heart of Sherwood? And they said, well, as of this date, it's just not going to be available for sale anymore. No. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I, I just won these awards. And, <laughs> and, and you're saying that nobody's going to be able to buy my book anymore. Oh. <clears throat> so I went to a lot of other small presses and gave them my pitch. And they all said, oh, well, I'm sorry, but your book has already had its launch. So we don't want it. We're not interested in something that's already been launched by another publisher. Right. So I talked to a friend of mine um, who lives in California. And um, he said, well, the only thing that you can do is just start your own. And then I would publish through Amazon. And so that's what I've done. Past and Promo Press um, is just basically <clears throat> me publishing through Amazon. But it just mm-hmm. looks a little cooler to have your own label than to say you know, Amazon because that's so right. generic. So. Oh, no, that's, that's totally cool. That's just another thing to put on the resume. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I, I just, there was no way that I was that book not available for sale. It's already sold like three times more than it did during the launch. It's still my best selling book. And um, I think that's probably maybe because people hear about it and then they tell their friends and then they buy it. And I also have a lot of paperback sales of Heart of Sherwood, which leads me to think more older people read it. I mean, I like a paper mm-hmm. book. And I know a lot of people like their iPads or their Kindles or whatever. And and those, you know, I sell a lot of ebooks, but um, I probably sell about an equal or even greater share of paperbacks of Heart of Sherwood. So I think it maybe appeals to the an older and as you can as see, well. Behind me, I like books. <laughs> <too. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an awesome bookshelf. Got a little bunny up there. Uh, yeah, that is the <laughs> pluck bunny. <laughs> the pluck bunny, cool. So, um, what is your writing space like? I know you you do a bit of traveling. So, what do you write on the road, or do you have a specific writing space oh. that you work in? Oh, yes, oh yes, yes. Um, basically, I have really been able to blossom. When I was teaching school, I was so busy. It took me like two years to write flat and um, it, it just, everything, and then it it just was so hard. But now I have all this time and I do write in my truck, primarily in my truck, um, in this little dark space that you see here. Uh, <laughs> I write on my laptop. I have 14 internet pages open with all of my research while I'm writing so I can keep <laughs> referring to everything and um, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I have I have a big question that I like to ask everybody. I'm going to set you okay. up for this a little bit. So let's say uh-huh. there was, oh, I don't know, maybe a pandemic or um, oh. you know, a snowstorm or something that, that traps you in your home and you can't go anywhere. What, and you have all the, the, you know, essentials that you need, but what are the three things that you would love or want or need to have with you? Okay, definitely. Well, of course, this has happened. I was stuck during Katrina. I was stuck during several snowstorms, some of them on the road in my truck. And of course, we've been having this pandemic affair. Um, <laughs> definitely my phone. I, I can, I am one of those people who was born when you had these rotary dial phones plugged into the wall. <laughs> I remember those, yeah. But I have to have my phone. You can't see it, it's black. Um, I have to have my phone, um, and I have to have my laptop because I, I spent enough years writing everything out by hand in spiral notebooks. I'm writing on my laptop now, so I've got to have that because that's that's where I that's where I do my writing. And and the other thing that would make life very very happy for me would be to have my dog with me. So Aww, you have a dog? Yeah, I uh, I do. Sweet little Australian shepherd. Oh, sweet. And what is the Australian Shepherd's yeah. name? Micah. Micah. Oh, Micah. Mm-hmm. 
That's sweet. Yes. Oh, and she, she loves her ball. Yeah, she's 14 years old. She oh, still goodness. loves her ball, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's nice to have. That's really cool. Well, we have probably a lot more things that we could ask you, and we're getting close to our time, but um, where can we find all of your things, all of your books? Okay. Oh, we well, didn't we need get to, to talk about that. Oh, yes, put that little thing up, please. please. Oh, yes. we <laughs> Let's see please, those please. covers. Let's see that cover art. There all we right. Go. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we didn't get to talk about the Night Flyer trilogy. Um, but there are three books about it. These are all can be found at Amazon.com. Um, you can look them up on Goodreads or BookBub as well. Um, and the Nightflyer trilogy is kind of a Batwoman meets Leonardo da Vinci. You kind of inspired Ooh. me a bit on that because I had yeah. never heard of steampunk. I didn't even know what steampunk was until I met you and, and read some of your stuff. And um, there's a little bit of steampunk flavor in... in um, that night flyer trilogy but yeah uh oh, we have a that. 1500s superhero and um she's she's just really kick butt awesome um so we don't want to forget that and over here you can see viking quest that's coming out in june and uh terror in time co collection of uh nine eerie tales is a set of sh uh, short stories that's a horror genre book as well as the uh as well as the tribute of blood. So if you if you don't want blood and gore, stick with the Edel Isles. They are uh, FF romances, but they're sweet romances. There's nothing erotic or, or uh, detailed um, in, in any of the scenes. And so basically PG-13. Yeah. <laughs> yes, PG-13. There you go. And uh, then we're looking over here on the right hand. Uh, well, to me, it's the right hand side. It could be your left hand side. I'm not sure. Um, Terry time, and those are a little bit scary. So. There's a Sorry, lot of blood friend. in Tribute and Blood. Oh, that's okay. Um, and so, okay, and so also we are in a few, um, we are in a few books together, aren't we? Some, some, uh, we are, we're in some of the collections. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And those are and on Amazon. IP Go ahead. Yes. If you if you go to the Melody Romeo Amazon author page, you will find all of those collections, all of those anthologies that mm -hmm. both of us are in. Yeah. Those are the um the remind me those Southern, Southern Haunts. Haunts. Southern Haunts. Yeah. The Southern Haunts. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, Southern Haunts. And I did some for State of Horror. I don't know if you no, so I didn't get a chance to do that before the uh, uh, publisher ran out. Um, yeah, I, I, that was a shame. They were a great publishing company, but yeah, yes. we, yeah. Um, State of Four was for all the different uh, different states. They had little horror stories mm -hmm. for different states. Those are great books too. I think. Um, well, I, I think our time is I up. Think Yes, and I may have enjoyed being with you. Next time, maybe it won't be night and I'll have more light. <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you so much. And until next time, everyone, keep reading, keep writing, and we can change the world one story at a time on the page. Thank you. You've got it. Thanks.